Take your Bibles this morning. Let's turn to the book of Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25. Message I've entitled, Ready or Not. Here I come. You play hide and seek as a little kid. Countdown, right, from whatever number. All the kids scatter, hide, you go, and you count, you get to the end of that countdown, and you end that countdown with that little sing-song phrase, ready or not, here I come. And that's a very simple thing, right? But if you think about it, that is a, a real life lesson, right? Because if, if you're counting, and, and if you get to the bottom of that countdown, and you're hidden, and it comes looking for you, you're good. You are prepared and ready to go. But if you scatter and then somebody steals your hiding spot and then you try to fit there and you don't fit in that spot and so you're still scrambling and it says, ready or not, here I come, you are totally unprepared and not ready for this game. And see, this happens through the rest of life, right? You're in school. Teacher says there'll be a test on Friday. Now, if you're studying and you're prepared and you're ready to go, no problem. Test comes, you get a good grade. But if you are not prepared all through the week while you're playing video games or doing whatever you do and the test is saying to you, ready or not, here I come. And then you don't get a good grade. A few years after that, you get a bill in the mail, right? And if you set that money back and you have it ready to go, when it comes time to pay the bill, no problem. You've, you've saved your money. But... If you spend your money on this, that, and the other thing, and you blow it and you waste it, and then it comes time to pay the bill, ready or not, here I come. It's not there. You find out you're pregnant, or your wife finds out she's pregnant. And you know that in roughly nine months, there's going to be a whole new world in your house. It's going to be a whole different ball game. It's all going to be different, Right? And you start thinking to yourself, yourself you start thinking, start, start thinking I'm, I'm going to be responsible for this person, this other person that's going to, you know, not only do I have to keep the thing breathing and alive, but it's like the whole time I'm doing that, it's going to be watching me. It's going to be seeing everything that I'm doing. But no matter how you feel, what anxiety you have in about nine months, ready or not, here I come. It's happening. See, without taking this to a real morbid place, let's just steer the car right off the cliff. Death's coming for every one of us. And see, we've got all these preparations from hide and seek to tests to bills to all these life events where death's coming and we're either ready for it or we're not. We're either prepared for what happens afterward or we're not. And every time that we um, go to the funeral home when we lose a loved one, or every time we get sick, or every time we break a bone and we're confronted with the fragility of our bodies, all of those things are reminders. It's death saying to us, ready or not, here I come. See, that really simple sing-song phrase, it's got a deeper meaning than just something you say when you get down to three, two, one, right? So when we look at this passage today, this is the idea of, of Matthew 25. Jesus is going to tell us a couple of parables in Matthew 25. And really the point of both of the parables is the same. Ready or not, here I come. Jesus has told the disciples. He's told the, everyone that, that this house pointing to the temple will be left desolate. And then he told the disciples that that, that that temple would be destroyed. And they ask him two questions. When will these things happen and what will be the signs that we should look for? Jesus tells them some of the signs and some of the things that are not signs. Then he begins to tell them when he answers the when question, he says, nobody can know the day or the hour. So you just need to be watchful and be prepared because I am coming again. You just need to be ready for it. Ready or not, here I come. These parables that he tells illustrate this truth. He's, he's already explained the truth. We won't get any, any new truth in this. It's just Jesus explaining or elaborating on the truth that he's already given, right? Let's read the parable, and then we'll talk about it a little bit. Um, verses 1 through 
13. This is the parable of the ten virgins. The next time we are together, two weeks when I'm back with you, we'll do the parable of the talents, which you're very familiar with probably. Let's, let's start in Matthew 25 and verse 1 and read this parable of the ten virgins. Jesus said, Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. But at midnight, there was a cry. Here's the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose. They trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, Since there will not be enough for us and for you, go rather to the dealers and buy for yourselves. And while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. John MacArthur, kind of summarizing this parable, says, The parable of the ten virgins underscores the importance of being ready for Christ's return in any event, even if he delays longer than expected. Because when he does return, there will be no second chances for the unprepared. I have, um, five, I think, five points today, but I'm going to try to move through them quickly. Some of them will be quick. Let's hit, just kind of turn the conversation so that we understand the parable and um, so that we see its importance for us. Let's, let's just turn the conversation a couple of different ways. And let's start by talking about the intrigue of the wedding ritual. We need to understand the wedding ritual. These parables can seem confusing to us if we don't get down to that intriguing or mysterious part. The way that they did weddings is intriguing to us because it's not the way we do weddings. Okay, So we need to understand that first of all, to understand this ritual that they have, how they would go about weddings. We've talked about this, or we talk about it a lot, say, around Christmas time, because Mary and Joseph were betrothed, and a lot of our information, we talk about it in that sense, right? But as it would go in a Jewish family, Jewish boy, Jewish girl, fall in love, Jewish boy goes to Jewish dad and says, I want to marry your daughter. And there's an arrangement made, right? They are then betrothed. This betrothal, they're... It's much like our engagement, sort of, but much more serious. Because like in the case of Mary and Joseph, remember, he had to divorce her, legally divorce her, because they were already betrothed, committed to one another. They didn't live with each other during that time. What was happening was preparations were being made. The, 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 the boy might build a house. The, the, things might begin, the, the bride might begin to, to gather things together so that when he came to get her, that, that she would be prepared and could dress up and be ready to go. And, and sometimes it was a, a year or more before the, the groom ever came back for the bride. But then when all the preparations were set, one night, all this happened in the evening time, one night the sun would go down Jewish boy would go after Jewish girl. And as he would go, there would be this procession that would kind of join in with him. And he would show up at the house and he would take her from her house. And, and they would begin to walk. They would begin to go back to his house or his father's house. And they would be, begin to celebrate a feast. And all along the way, there and back, there would be people that would join in the procession. And then that would be the group that would join them for the feast. These people had been invited they knew that the feast was coming. They knew maybe that he was coming and, and going to receive her. And so they would come and follow along with him. And that's what's, being, that's what's happening in the story, right? They've been betrothed. That time's over with. Now the groom is coming for the bride. Now, if you notice in the parable, one of the things that Jesus says, or one of the things that we should probably note, is that there's a long time of delay. Like verse 5 says that the bridegroom was delayed. Because what would happen is he would go to get her. He would go and get her as soon as the sun went down. Like, like at, at the evening time, at the, at, as, as the sun went down, he would go and get her. But that's not what's happening here, is it? Like they, they expect him to come. These virgins expect him to come. But they wait and wait. And, they wait and the sun goes down and they wait. And he's not... And then notice what the passage says. There is a midnight cry. 
hours have gone by. And they get tired and they get so there's a big delay. This is a beautiful picture. This groom and bride picture is beautiful in the sense that it shows us Christ returning for us, right? Now, as I talk about this, you need to know that, that in, in this case, the church is not the bride, right? There's a, different, there's a different thing going on in this parable. But when we think about the groom returning for his bride, that's what he's promised us, right? He is betrothed us to him like there's this promise that he will return for us again what did he say i go to prepare a place for you for in my father's house are many mansions kind of idea right this he's going to prepare a place and then he will come again and he will receive us unto himself so that where he is there we may be also the bible would say it right this idea that he's coming he's promised it and in this passage, like I say, it, the, the analogy kind of breaks down with the bride and groom, but that's okay because in this particular parable, the virgins, the wise virgins represent the church, those that know Christ, right? One parable never gives us the whole story, right? The same way that, say, um, say that you have different pictures. Of, well, even for us as a church, we're a bride, we're a body, Right? There's various terms used for us. When you think about uh, Christ, he is, uh, he is King of kings and Lord of lords, and he is the lion, and he is the lamb, and he is the cornerstone. Right? You see, he's all of these things that you find in Scripture. So one analogy doesn't cover all of it. It gives us a part of the whole, and that's what's happening here. Right? And what's, what's important about this is or something that we should focus on is that in his coming to receive us as his bride, there is delay. Like in this case, it was he was supposed to be coming in the evening and he came at midnight. But everything that Jesus has told us over the last few chapters indicates that there is going to be a delay. There's going to be a, a span of time between his ascension, his, his first coming, and his second coming. Think about the things that we've looked at already. Right. If you go back to 24, he began to talk to those disciples about all these events that would occur before he came. For those events to occur, there's got to be some time, right? Like those in the early church were looking for him to come any day. But there's there's events that have to happen in between there. He said in verse he said in chapter 24 was it around verse 14 or so. He said the gospel would be preached to the entire world. It's going to take some time to make this happen. At the end of chapter 24, he told them an illustration when he said that no one knows the day or the hour. He told them it's like a master that leaves and the servants don't know when he's returning. There's a delay. There's a, there's a span of time between his leaving and his, and his coming back where, where you don't know. It's a, it's a delay. This is the same kind of idea that's transferred into the parable of the talents that we'll look at next time. And it's the same picture that's here in the delay. They were, they were expecting to come. They were looking for him to come at the evening time. It wasn't until the midnight cry that, that he came, right? This picture of the delay, all of these pictures kind of fall into this wedding ritual. And so if you understand that a little better, you understand what's happening with these virgins. You see the intrigue of the wedding ritual. Let's look secondly at this. Let's talk a little bit about this. Let's inspect the singular difference between these wise virgins and foolish virgins. There is only one singular difference between the two, and we need to inspect it, investigate it, and figure out what it is. When we read this parable, it talks about ten virgins. This is just a a word used to talk about the idea of them being young ladies. Think about it in terms of bridesmaids. You could kind of think about it like that, right? But these these, uh, wise virgins and foolish virgins, that's the distinction between them. And and when reading this parable, you should not read it and think, oh, we got five girls that are real smart, and you got five girls that are real dumb. That's not what the parable's about, right? This is not blondes and some other color, you know what I mean? This is, is, sorry, Tammy said, how dare you? This is not, that's not what we're supposed to get in our minds, right? The word foolish is the word moros. We could think about, maybe we get that word moron kind of idea. From moros, and it really doesn't mean anything about being stupid as much as it means being unprepared. 
The definition of moros, he who sees not what is proper or necessary. There's no forethought here. Wise virgins, foolish virgins. And the parable makes that clear distinction that there's five of each. But in the course of that distinction, I want you to think for a moment of all the things, before you think about the difference that they have, I want you to think about the things that they have in common. Because essentially everything about them in the parable is the same. Right? They've all been invited to the wedding. And they have all responded positively and said, we will go. They're all waiting for the bridegroom. They all have lamps, right? The Bible uses this idea, lamps, torches. You need to imagine a little clay bowl or pot with a wick. It's, all you're, it's what you're looking at. Maybe like a little clay vessel with a, a wick that had a place to, to hold oil, right? That, that's what you need to be thinking about, right? They all had lamps, right? They all fell asleep. There's no guilt attached to this in the... In the uh, parable, it's not like, um, you know, this parable's uh, saying that, well, they, they didn't watch and wait. Like the disciples in the garden, they fell asleep. There's no guilt attached to that necessarily. They just, he didn't come it, as soon as the sun set. He came later, and they all slept and got weary. When the cry came, they all woke up, right? It wasn't that the wise ones woke up and the foolish ones were left behind. They all woke up, Right? They all got everything ready. They all trimmed their lamps. And they all got ready to head out and go follow in the procession. They have so many things that are in common that when you look at them prior to, that, prior to the midnight cry, they all appear to be prepared to go. But they're not. The distinction, the one distinction between these two is given, um, let's say in verse 8. Then the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. The difference between the two is that one group has oil, and the other group does not. There's no street lights, right? If you're going to follow in this procession, you got to have some way to see where you're going, right? Sometimes we've been, uh, we've been camping, and we've, maybe it's been me and the four boys going somewhere in the dark, and this is what I can tell you. If you want to see where you're going, do not give the flashlight to Micah, right? Because who knows what we're looking at, but it ain't where we're going, right? See, everybody needs their own. Everybody needs to see where they're going. Everybody needs a lamp to be able to see what's happening in the procession. And these don't have their oil. They don't have it. And this, when you begin to look at Scripture and the beauty of, of kind of some of the... You know in Scripture, oil is a picture of something. Oil is a picture of the Holy Spirit in Scripture. It, especially like in the Old Testament, right? In the Old Testament, they would anoint people with oil. Right? That sounds like a very religious, spiritual thing to do, anoint people with oil. But you understand, it's just oil. There's nothing magical about it. It's not, it's not holy oil that's had some kind of something sprinkled on it or been blessed or anything like that. There's nothing special about the oil. It's just oil. But it was a picture that, say, a king in the Old Testament was anointed with oil. That oil would be poured over them and it would coat them and it would drip down them and the idea was is that it was like this picture that the Holy Spirit would rest on them and would cover them and would permeate their life and their rule and would be would rest on them in this idea right all is is seen in like the, in the tabernacle the lampstand which was the only light in the room the idea was is that it was to never be out of all that all was to always be in the lampstand in order for it to be lit and provide, all, provide light in the room all the time. There's a picture here for us, right? If you begin to talk about, you set two people side by side, they live on the same street, we'll say they work at the same job, we'll even say they go to the same church. 
and you set them side by side, one of them is a Christian, one of them is not. Do you know what the difference is between those two people? It's the Holy Spirit. It's that indwelling power of the Holy Spirit. You see, it's not that those that are believers in Jesus Christ are righteous and those that are outside of of Christ are sinful. We're all sinful. Every one of us. There's no difference. This is a similarity. Bad behavior. Bad. uh, uh, All of these things happen in all of us, right? Right? Now, let's not make it a way of life, but you know what I mean. We've all got moments where we don't act as Christ does. You know what the difference is? The Holy Spirit. The person that's not a believer in Jesus Christ does not have the indwelling power of the Spirit to convict of sin and to enlighten when it comes to God's Word and and to, to help us live in the power of the Spirit. This is the difference. And you see, the Bible's very clear that if a person is not right with him, if there's no relationship with Jesus, there is no Holy Spirit. This is the marked factor. This is the the singular difference that you find. Now, there are other things that, that happen because we have the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit, right? But this is a marked difference between a genuine believer and just one who says they are. It's the Holy Spirit. Romans Verse 5 and uh, chapter 5 and verse 5 says, God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. I like this one. This one's even more clear. Romans 8 and verse 9 says, You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. As a believer, you don't act as your sinful desires. That's not what has control of you. Your sinful flesh does not have control of you, right? You are not in the flesh, but you are in the Spirit. The Spirit has control of you. If, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you, and then to make it very clear, he says, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. 1 Corinthians 6 says that our bodies are a temple of the Holy Spirit. It's a place where, where the Holy Spirit resides Same thing is said in 2 Corinthians 6 and 16. We are the temple of the living God. The difference between these two is that the wise virgins have all, the foolish virgins do not. This is the singular difference between the two. Christians are not special in the sense that there is some kind of something unique or different about them. When it comes to just like it's not the Christian just has a a stronger willpower. To just, you know, not lie and not steal and not cheat. It's that the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit has changed our thought patterns and changed our... If we just, if we'll just let Him have control of us, get out of the flesh, let the Spirit work through us, this is what happens. It changes our thinking, it changes our behavior, it changes our attitude, it changes our worldview. Apart from that... Everybody does what they want to in their own eyes. Whatever feels good, we do it. Whatever heart tells you, you do that. And it's dangerous territory because it's all being controlled by sinful, selfish flesh. The difference between the believer in Jesus Christ and the one who's only saying it is the Spirit. In this particular passage, too, what's what's interesting about this passage is, is that these Foolish virgins, everything about them is positive, right? Like they're waiting for the bridegroom to come. They're waiting to go to the wedding. But what this parable is saying in some degree is that it's not just enough just to make a confession to Christ. It's not just enough just to to have a positive attitude about Christ and see him in a positive light. It's not even enough just to believe that he lived or that he died on the cross. Right? Listen to what David Platt says. Some people will look like followers of Jesus. They may have responded to an invitation, made a confession, expressed some affection toward Christ, but they will not endure to the end. 
This is prevalent in our day, as many would call themselves Christians because of something that happened in the past. But their hearts are now far from God, and they aren't trusting in Christ today. You see, what David Platt is saying when he says enduring to the end is we have to recognize that there is, there's not something special about us that brings about our salvation. It's not like we make some sort of decision where we say, oh, when I was five, I made a decision to follow Jesus. And I trusted him then. It doesn't matter what I do now. I trusted him then, so I'm good. You understand, salvation is something that happened to you, it is happening to you, and it will happen to you. The same trust and faith that I put in him then, I have to put in him every day thereafter. It's this constant and total dependence on him, allowing him to work through me. This is what he's talking about. It's not, it's not something that you did. It's a continuous thing. It's continuing in our lives. This is seen in this picture of these lamps where, if you think about it, um, the, the foolish virgins trim their lamps and then they lit them. But guess what happens? They don't stay lit, right? There's no enduring. You see, if I were just to tell you, you want to be saved? Here's what you do. You go to church and you read your Bible and you pray every day. And you do good things. You know what the problem with that is? You can't do it. You're not equipped. You don't have, we might say, you don't have the gas in the tank. You don't have the oil in the lamp to read your Bible every day and pray every day and go to church and to do good things. You don't have that. We're not equipped with it. It must be given to us. It must be poured into us, the Holy Spirit. And then we must rely on that power. It's not the wick burning alone. It's the wick saturated in that oil that brings about this constant sustaining light. Can a person go to church, read their Bible every day, pray, do good things? Yes, but it doesn't sustain and even if they live a lifetime of doing it, when they draw their last breath, there is nothing. There is nothing. There's no gas in the tank. There's no oil in the lamp when we stand before him. It's this constant dependence on him. Ligon Duncan says, they, these that look like they have life in the spirit, they have a form of piety, but they deny its power. And unprepared, they travel on to meet the judge. None of us, none of us must presume to be prepared. All of us must be watchful of our hearts. We must examine ourselves to see if we are trusting in him, lest we, unprepared, travel on. See, it's not just enough just to say, oh, yeah, 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 I believe, I believe in Jesus. Yeah, I've, I've always believed in Jesus. Always believed in Jesus. It's not enough. You see, sometimes... That's the response that I get. Sometimes if you talk to somebody and, and you say, you know, uh, you, know you start to tell them about Jesus. Oh, yeah, I'm a, I'm a Christian. Pull that scab. What, why are you a Christian? What, what would you base that on? Oh, I've always believed. I come from a Christian home. We've always believed about Jesus. Mm. It's not a real solid testimony. You know, you know why that's not a solid testimony? Because that's about something that you have done. You have always believed in Jesus. Mm. Mm. It's, not, it's not. See, the gospel is about what Christ has done for us. You see this intrigue of the wedding, wedding, wedding which wool, and you see the inspection of this singular difference. Let's look thirdly at this. Let's talk a little bit about the impossibility of borrowed faith. See, these bridesmaids that aren't prepared, the time comes, and look at what happens in verse 8. Oh, we want to borrow some of your oil. Give us some of your oil for your lamps. It don't work that way. In fact, these wise virgins say this, there's not enough oil in our lamps for us to have and you to have. 
we'll both end up in the dark. What you need to do is you need to go and try to find a sell, someone who's selling oil. Now, let's stop. Let's time out right here before we get on with this. Think about that in this particular parable. It's midnight. Imagine these girls going down to the marketplace, right? They really are blonde if they think they're going to go down to the marketplace at midnight. And somebody's just going to be over there, midnight oil salesman, you know, 24-hour oil salesman, you know. It's not the 7-Eleven, you know. That's not down there. Where are they going to find this oil? See, they don't. That's, that's just, I believe that when they come back later and they knock on the door, there's no oil to be had. They've stumbled their way in the dark to get there, and they're still not let in. Let us borrow some of yours. Oh, I'm a Christian, David. You, you are. Well, tell me, what are you basing that on? Why, why would you say that you're a Christian? Well, you see, my granddaddy was a deacon over it. My mama prayed for me every night. You should have seen my mama pray. She was a praying woman. It don't work that way. Faith in Jesus Christ is a personal thing between you and him. It's almost become a catchphrase. I remember in uh, the, the idea of him being our personal savior. Like it, it's even made fun of. If, if you, you know, in Major League. You remember Major League? Oh, uh, I think his name was Joe Boo was over there. Going to help him. Joe Boo going to help him hit the curveball. Remember? And that third baseman asked him, he said, Have you ever thought about accepting Jesus Christ as your personal savior? That catchphrase, that line is kind of made fun of. But the truth is, he must be a personal savior. You can't borrow the faith of someone else. You can't cling to the coattails of the faith of your grandfather or your grandmother or just because you had godly parents, just because you were raised in a godly home or you got brought to church, right? You can't hang on the coattails of somebody else. It doesn't work that way. Paul even said this. I would have it that I would be accursed if it meant you being saved. That this is what Paul wanted. Paul would say, look, Karen, if it meant that you got to go to heaven, if it meant that I had to go to hell so that you could go to heaven, I would go to hell so that you could go to heaven. But it doesn't work that way. I could do silly things. I could make Facebook devotions. From now until Jesus comes back, every day I could make one. I could stand up here in this pulpit and do some kind of crazy dance. I could jump through rings of fire. I could juggle chainsaws. I could get down on my hands and knees and crawl around this building until my skin was raw. Until I was nothing but just bloody pulp on my knees and hands. And it would do no good to get you any further into the kingdom of heaven because your faith cannot be borrowed at all. It must be you surrendering to the convicting power of the Holy Spirit in your life. And that's not something I can do for you. It's not something I can do for you. This is a decision that every one of us must make. The Moody Commentary says this, spiritual preparation cannot be bought or borrowed at the last minute. No one can rely on anyone else. Our relationship with God must be our own. It must be ours. It must be, it must be this idea that, that, that we have a personal Savior. See the intrigue and inspection and possibility. Let's look fourthly at this. Let's turn the conversation here. Let's talk a little bit about their illusion of false security. When you get down to verses 11 and 12... There is these foolish virgins that come back. As I said, I believe they've gone to the market. They've looked, no oil to be had. They come back, they're knocking at the door. Let us in, let us in. And they still hadn't got any oil. No oil to be had. John R. Rice says this about this section. The foolish expected to go. One of the saddest truths taught in the Bible is that multitudes expect to go to heaven who will be disappointed. Listen, they depend on their wick of human profession 
and human righteousness instead of upon the oil of the Holy Spirit, the supernatural birth from above. In those preceding verses, the bridesmaids expected to go. Those foolish virgins, prior to, them, prior to the sun going down, they expected to go. Between sundown and midnight, they expected to go. Even when the groom came and they were unprepared, they make it all the way to the wedding feast expecting to go. But note, they were no more prepared before the sun went down than they are now. No matter what appearance this looked like, no matter what was going, no matter what it looked like or what it appeared to be, they were no more prepared before the sun went down than they were standing in front of the door with empty pockets and no oil, right? Adam Clark says, what a dismal thing it is not to discover the emptiness of one's heart of all that is good until it is too late to make any successful application for relief. By the time the groom came and the call went out, all the sellers of oil were closed. All the, all the preparation that should have been made was not made. And I'm not sure what's happening there. I'm not sure what happens in people's minds. I've, I've maybe heard, have you ever heard a pastor say, somebody will say, oh, uh, I, I haven't lived really. When, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to live. And, and people used to always talk about sowing their wild oats and then get right with Jesus or whatever. I don't know that people do that, but is that something we consciously think about? Is that something that, that is a young part I mean, I don't know, I'm, but I'm thinking as a young person, like never get in that mindset where you're saying to yourself, I, I, I've got plenty of time. I, I got plenty of time to get things right with him, and, and then I'll do it. I'll do it someday, right? Because here's the problem. We're not all promised someday. Here's the problem, right? It's the problem with this. We're not all promised that someday. We don't know when our last breath will be, right? We don't know when he's coming. We don't know any of those things. That's what we talked about last week with this idea that no one knows the day or the hour. It's like this huge gamble to assume. It's also a fallacy to think that you can hear the trumpet and see the eastern skies split and say, okay, now's the time. Jesus, I want to make it right. Right? Doesn't work that way. See the intrigue and the inspection, impossibility and illusion. But let's think about one more thing before we finish. Let's talk about the importance of prepared vigilance. The importance of prepared vigilance. These foolish bridesmaids show up. And they say, Lord, Lord, open to us. He says... Truly I say to you, I do not know you. If you go back to verse 10, those who were ready went in to the marriage feast and the door was shut. That's a finality to things, right? The end of verse 10 signifies this finality. The door is shut. There is no other chance. But what's heartbreaking is this statement that the groom makes to them. They're shut out and the end has come and it's like they don't know the end has come. Lord, Lord, please let us in. We're not there yet, but you know at the end of, of, the end of Matthew 25, Jesus will say there will be those who will stand before me on that day and say, Lord, Lord. Lord, Lord, let us in. And what does he say? Sorry, I don't know you. This is a common phrase that would have been used of people in that culture if the door or the gate had been shut after a certain hour. Let's think about it for a minute. 
There's no street lights, right? There's no, there's no modern police light, right? There's no, no, no police force. And so if, if you open the door, and this person is either not who they say they are, or you don't know who they are, you don't know what their intentions are, it's probably safer that you just don't open the door. And so if somebody came knocking on your door after dark, and you didn't know who they were in that culture, your response would be, sorry, friend, I, I don't know you. I don't know you. I can't open the door. Surely you understand why I can't open it. That's the response that comes. I, I, I don't know you. You see, this goes back to that idea that it's not just enough to have a pos positive sentiment to Jesus, right? You can't just believe good things about Jesus. Real, true, abiding faith an indwelling of the Holy Spirit is what is producing this relationship with Him. This ongoing relationship. And He says, I, I, don't, I don't know you. It is irreversible. The consequences at this point are irreversible. And this is why it is so important that you and I have this prepared vigilance about us. That we're watching and we're waiting and we know that he's returning again. We recognize his warning in scripture is, ready or not, here I come. And we recognize that the last part of that is absolutely true. When he says, here I come, he means it. Everything that we've looked at in 24, out of all the things that we are uncertain about of 24, the one glaring truth that we all know with absolute certainty is, he is coming. That's the one glaring truth in all the confusion of 24, right? Trying to figure out whether we're talking about 70 AD or the future or whatever. In all of the uncertainty, the one glaring truth is he's coming. The question for us is, ready or not? Prepared or not? Living with the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit or trusting in the wick of human righteousness. It's either one of the two, right? Every one of us should be, because he is coming, every one of us should be living with this preparedness, this expectation of his coming. I read a little uh, segment this, this week, and, and I thought it was good. I thought I would share it with you. You know, we talked last week about this idea that no one knows the day or the hour that he's coming. But there was a time in the early 1800s when a lot of people um, got really obsessed with this idea of when he was coming again. Here's what happened. In America during that time, uh, the end of the 1700s, early 1800s, that was a time of great revival in our country. Um, sometimes called the Second Great Awakening, right? And it was a, all the, just revivals all over the place. And so what you had is you had a lot of people coming to Christ, and you had a lot of zeal for him, but you also had a lot of people that really had no theological education. They didn't have really like a spiritual background. They were very zealous, but they just didn't know or, or read or understand the Bible enough to really apply it. You know what I mean? They were like... They were like babies in Christ trying to write some treatise out about, you know, serious, deep things. And they got obsessed with when he was coming again. There were all these date setters that tried to read in Scripture and try to pull out when he was coming again. One of those guys was a guy from New York. His name was William Miller. And he, he really, it was Daniel's prophecy, like that 70-week prophecy that he really dug in. 1818, he predicted that Christ would return in 1843 or 1844. It was pretty, pretty sketchy then about the time. But later on, he said that it was certainly going to be on October 22nd, 1844. He set a date. He said it would be on October 22nd, 1844. As time goes on, right? This was like, you know, 1839... There's a big financial crisis in the country, and things start looking grim. It's not a good time, and people are starting to say, well, you know what? <laughs> he could be right. This could be the end. And people began to get really pumped up for this 
coming of Christ on October 2nd, 1844. You know the end of this story. October 22nd, 1844, people are going to the mountaintops to await Christ's return. They're filling into churches to wait for Jesus to come back. But the day comes and goes, and no Jesus. And then there's this problem. Then something begins to happen around that time. Following those years, while you had this time in the early 1800s where it was revivals and tons of people coming to Christ, you get to this middle section of the 1800s, and they're just not. Very apathetic to things of Christ. You see, what happened was there was all this, like, urgency and expectancy and he's returning again and and even the predictions the people were so obsessed with even the predictions of his return like charts about biblical prophecy were in the newspaper right next to the current events and the you know all this stuff it was it was right there like you'd find the the sports section and the and the you know the business section you'd find the prophecy section it was an important time it was something people were interested in But when this guy makes a false prediction and then people watch and they see that it doesn't happen, the sense of urgency begins to drop. Well, if he didn't come then, he might not come at all. Well, you know, it's been a long time since Jesus said he was coming again. I mean, should we really be looking for it every day? I mean, come on. You know what began to happen in people's lives? Sometimes that that time of spiritual decline, instead of being called the Great Awakening, is called the Great Disappointment in the years that followed. It had a real impact on people. And and the, the reason for that spiritual decline was because they lost this sense of urgency in His coming. For you and I, here's what we know. He is coming again. What we need to find out. What we need to search and examine our hearts to discover today is, are we ready or not? Are we prepared? Do we have oil in the lamp? Are are we going to be shut out of the feast because we do not have a relationship with him and he does not know us? Have we gotten drowsy and lazy and we've quit watching and we've quit waiting and we've quit working And we just find just a coast until whatever happens, happens. That's not an attitude that the believer is supposed to have. He's coming. Are we ready or not? Lord, we recognize that as we look to this passage, that Lord, what we're finding here is a stark reminder that we must personally be ready for your coming. We can't trust in somebody else and we can't just lean on our hope so's and our false security because it will do us no good on that day. Lord, we know that your word teaches here very clearly that there is a finality. There will be a time when we will be unable to make a decision, that we will be unable to surrender to you because the time has passed. Lord, we thank you for being gracious. And Lord, if you're speaking to our hearts right now about the fact that we have no relationship with you, Lord, I pray that you would give that person boldness to come and receive you. Lord, we pray for the one who's just gotten apathetic and has just lost their sense of urgency when it comes to the mission of spreading the gospel to the entire world before your coming, looking expectantly to the skies, awaiting your return. Lord, forgive us for our complacency and help us to obediently follow you now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.